Welcome to another message from Columbus First Assembly. Thanks for listening as we strive to learn and live the Word and ways of God. Our hope is that you're encouraged by today's message. This week and then next week will be the last two sessions as we have taken the book of Daniel and done it in what's called an expository study. That means that you do it verse by verse all the way through from chapter 1, verse 1, all the way, and this will be through chapter 12, verse number uh, 13. This is our 12th session, and this is a very unique uh, part of the book of Daniel, and so I've entitled it this, A Glimpse into the Angelic Demonic Realm. The 10th chapter of the book of Daniel, God pulls back the curtain a little bit and allows us a glimpse into spiritual forces and how they interact with the world. Um, And it is the only place in the scripture where we actually see these things. Uh, And so we are going to look at that and see what we're able to gather and to learn. So a glimpse into the angelic and demonic realm. Now, before we get into the text, I'm only going to read one verse, and then we're going to go elsewhere. So you can keep your Bible on your lap. Uh, The rest of the verses are going to come up on the screen. But chapter 10, verse 1 says this, In the third year of the reign of King Cyrus of Persia, Daniel, also known as Belteshazzar, had another vision. Okay, so the time frame of the visions have been going on. Daniel's first vision took place when Belshazzar was king. And he's now gone. And Belshazzar was the ruler that Daniel interpreted the writing on the wall. He's gone, the kingdom fell, and Darius the Mede came in. Darius the Mede is the ruler who was tricked by those who hated Daniel, and Daniel got put in the lion's den. So time is gone. Now there's a new ruler in place, and his name is Cyrus. He's king of Persia. It is now the third year of Cyrus's rule. But the interesting thing about Cyrus is, in the first year of his rule, something very important happened. Last time when we talked, when we were in Daniel chapter 9, Daniel was studying the book of Jeremiah. And in the book of Jeremiah, Daniel read the verses where God had said that the people of Israel would be sent to Babylon, would be in captivity for 70 years. And Daniel, figuring at the time that this took place until the, the time or until that date, recognized that the 70 years was coming to an end. Yet he could not see how anything would have happened to change things, but he began to pray. He began to pray about this. And he said, this is what you promised, Lord. And he then received a vision. Well, this is now the third year of Cyrus. Let me show you what happened in the first year of Cyrus. The book of Ezra, chapter 1. You don't have to go there, but here it is. Look at what happened two years ago in Daniel's time. In the first year of King Cyrus of Persia, the Lord fulfilled the prophecy he had given through Jeremiah. Cyrus came in, conquered Darius the Mede. Cyrus is now king. In the first year of King Cyrus of Persia, remember, Daniel couldn't figure out how this would ever take place. But look how it did. The Lord fulfilled the prophecy he had given through Jeremiah. He stirred the heart of Cyrus to put this proclamation in writing and to send it throughout his kingdom. Look, this this is a, a, a king who is not a follower of Yahweh. But God was able to put in his heart to send this proclamation throughout the kingdom. This is what King Cyrus of Persia says, the Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth. He has appointed me to build him a temple at Jerusalem, which is in Judea. Any of you who are his people may go to Jerusalem in Judah to rebuild this temple of the Lord, the God of Israel who lives in Jerusalem, and may your God be with you. A brand new king, and the Lord puts it upon his heart. I don't know that the king knew. Remember, this is Ezra who's writing it. Ezra knew what the prophecy of Jeremiah was. I don't know if the king knew about the prophecy of Jeremiah. It didn't matter. 
The Lord stirred his heart. There is a proverb that I have memorized somewhat um, in a different translation, but it says, the heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord, and he moves it any way that he wants. Don't forget, whether it's our government, whether it's another foreign government, whether it's someone like Cyrus, the heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord, and we can be praying for our government, and we can be praying that God would be moving in the heart of our president, in the heart of our congressman, in the heart of our Supreme Court justices, so that God can be directing, because God is concerned about his kingdom, and God's kingdom does come upon the earth. God's will is done upon the earth, even if he uses a foreign king. Daniel couldn't see how it was going to happen when Darius the Mede was king. Cyrus comes in, it would even seem to be less practical. Because remember, Darius the Mede had Daniel thrown in the lion's den and saw the miraculous provision of God. He praised the God of heaven. It would make sense that maybe he would be willing to do this, but he's gone. And now we have Cyrus. So it's in the third year of Cyrus that we pick up the story here. And so now if you will go to your scripture and let us read, and I will comment as we go through And we will talk about this very fascinating chapter in the book of Daniel. In the third year of the reign of King Cyrus of Persia, Daniel, also known as Belteshazzar, had another vision. And he understood that the vision concerned events certain to happen in the future, times of war and great hardship. So he has another vision. It's a very perplexing vision for him. Now, verse 2 in the New Living Translation actually is a bit confusing in the way that it is translated, and I'll explain um, what's going on here. It says, when this vision came to me, I, Daniel, had been in mourning for three whole weeks. The vision that Daniel received three weeks prior was what prompted him to begin to pray. See, what it was is it said, I, Daniel, had been in mourning for three whole weeks. All that time I had eaten no rich food, No meat or wine crossed my lips, and I used no fragrant lotions until those three weeks had passed. The vision he received in verse 1 sent him to prayer and fasting. It it perplexed him. He needed an understanding. He desired an understanding. The vision in verse 2 that's being talked about is what takes place in verse 4. On April 23rd, As I was standing on the bank of the great Tigris River, I looked up and saw a man dressed in linen clothing with a belt of pure gold around his waist. His body looked like a precious gem. His face flashed like lightning and his eyes flamed like torches. His arms and feet shone like polished bronze and his voice roared like a vast multitude of people. Only I, Daniel, saw the vision. That's the vision that came 21 days later. So what we have is we have the vision of the time of the end and the war and things being perplexed. And Daniel is in prayer and fasting for 21 days, and then he receives a vision. Now, this vision was um, not a dream. It actually took place in a real location on the Tigris River on a specific date. And the New Living says April 23rd. That is the date this took place. This took place April 23rd, 536 B.C., Now, how do we know that it took place then? The uh, Hebrew text says this, and uh, the the NIV says it this way, um, on the 24th day of the first month. This is in the third year of Cyrus' reign. Ancient calendars tell us when the third year of Cyrus' reign was, and the Hebrew calendar, the 24th day of the first month, and it lines up with our modern calendars as April 23rd, 536 B.C., This happened in a specific location, and it happened on a very specific day. And Daniel has a vision. Now, this is a very fascinating vision, and some of what takes place here I find to be very fascinating. So, in verse 7, it says, Only I, Daniel, saw the vision. The men with me saw nothing. But they were suddenly terrified and ran away to hide. When... There is a supernatural manifestation of this type. Daniel actually saw the being, the angel. Those that were with him did not see it with their eyes, but they felt something. And it terrified them. As a matter of fact, Daniel felt some things, and he just grew physically weak. This is why I'm a little bit suspect. Not not always. I think that God can be gracious. 
But I'm a little bit suspect with people who have all these encounters with these uh, angelic beings and these supernatural beings and they're sweet and all of these things. The Bible seems to indicate that when an angel appears, a lot of times people cannot stand. And that's what happened to Daniel. And even the men who didn't see the angel knew something was going on and it was powerful. Now, I'm sure that God can have his angels restrict their glory or their power or something like that so as to not terrify people. But I think sometimes the encounters people have uh, do not line up with the biblical encounters of angelic beings. And so I think if, if, if you have one and it was this, you know, question it. Seek it. Just don't accept it because this was powerful. Only I, Daniel, saw the vision, verse 7 again. The men with me saw nothing but were suddenly terrified and ran away to high. So I was left there all alone to see this amazing vision. And look how Daniel responded. My strength left me. My faith grew, face grew deathly pale, and I felt very weak. Then I heard the man speak, and when I heard the sound of his voice, I fainted and lay there with my face on the ground. The voice of this divine creature, this angelic being, did him in. Powerful encounter. Verse 10, just then a hand touched me and lifted me, still trembling to my hands and knees. So he's down flat. So this hand gives him some strength. He gets up to his hands and his knees. And the man said to me, Daniel, you are very precious to God. So listen carefully to what I have to say to you. Stand up, for I've been sent to you. And when he said this to me, I stood up still trembling. Daniel, you are very precious to God. Daniel gets some strength back here. We're going to skip a bit, and I want you to go forward to verse 18. Then the one who looked like a man touched me again, and I felt my strength returning. Don't be afraid, he said, for you are very precious to God. Peace, be encouraged, be strong. And as he spoke these words to me, I suddenly felt stronger and said to him, Please speak to me, my Lord, for you have strengthened me. I want us to spend a few moments, and I, I, I'm looking for feedback, so everybody with me, get ready to give me some feedback. How do you think Daniel felt after he heard that affirmation? Let me read the affirmation again to you so you can uh, get a sense of it. Daniel, you are very precious to God. How do you think Daniel felt? You've got this angel who has knocked you off your feet because of the divine power. And then he speaks to you. And he says, you are very precious to God. How do you think he felt? All right, let's put this way. How would you feel? Tell me, how would you feel if someone, a divine being of some type, an angelic being, literally spoke those words to you? What would it do to you? Make you feel very honored, Okay. What else? How would it make you feel? Uh, yeah, Bill. Relief. relief. Why would it give you relief? Okay, and Bill is saying that, you know, you've been following God and you've been trying to do what is right and this type of an affirmation would give you relief that, oh, I am doing the right thing. Okay, how else? How would you feel if... You had an encounter like this. How would you feel? Confused. Okay. You know what? I think that is, that is accurate. I mean, <laughs> there's a whole lot of stuff going on. How else? How would you feel? Proud? <laughs> Relieved that he wasn't going to kill me. You are very precious to God. How ma okay, let me, let me ask you this. How many of you would love to hear something like this about you? Let 
Now, I'm, I'm speculating here, I, but I think that the Scripture kind of backs me up here, but you can disagree with me, and I'm not going to argue it. I think, you know, Daniel receives some strength from this angel, but in verse number 19, don't be afraid, he said, for you are very precious to God. Peace, be encouraged, be strong. And as he spoke these words to me, I suddenly felt stronger. Affirmation is strengthening. Is it not? Affirmation and encouragement can be strengthening. And I think all of us, if God would to, were to speak like this through an angel, you know, bang, there he is. It would, it would do something. Um, you know, Jenny said she'd feel proud, and I don't think that's in a bad way. I mean, my goodness, an angel is saying, God, I'm very precious to God. I'm very, I'm, I'm precious to God. But here's the thing, folks. Hasn't God already spoken a lot of affirmations to us and over us? Think of it. What affirmations has God spoken to us. What's a scriptural affirmation? Yes, Bill. He'll never leave us or forsake us. There's an affirmation. What else? Affirmations that God has already spoken to us. Yeah. Okay. That we have the ability to do all things through Christ. An affirmation. What are some other affirmations that God has spoken over us? How he loves us. One verse says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. That's a love that has no end. It's everlasting. He has loved us with that kind of a love. We're the righteousness of God through Christ. We are the apple of his eye. It says in one place that our names are like tattooed upon his hand. He loves us that much. There are affirmation after affirmation after affirmation after affirmation that God makes about us. Um, we are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy people. Those are affirmations. Those are what God spoke, speaks about us. He says, you are forgiven. You are cleansed. You are blood-bought, sanctified, spirit-filled. That's an affirmation. And I'm just wondering, this is speculation now, not what the text necessarily is teaching, but I'm just wondering. I'm wondering if some of us are walking around in a level of weakness because we're not hearing the affirmations that God is speaking over us and to us. Because we have disconnected ourselves from his word. These affirmations come through his word. Sure, they can come from someone else who God uses to affirm us, but most of the time they're through his word. Are you familiar with the affirmations of God's word towards you? Do you have these committed to memory? Do you remember them to yourself? I'm, I'm, this afternoon I'm going through this and I'm speaking to myself. There are days that I'm feeling kind of down, and usually that means I have not been speaking to myself what God has already spoken to me. And I wonder if the affirmations in the Word of God, when we start speaking them to ourselves, when we read them again in the Word of God, if they do not begin to strengthen us as Daniel was strengthened by the words of the angel. Daniel, you are precious to God. Sometimes the affirmations are woven into words of songs. The theology of the song has caught the affirmation of the scripture. There was a song years ago that um, I don't remember much of the song, but I remember one of the lines that said, if I'd been the only one who turned and walk, walked away, still you would have come for me. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that you could be saved. That's how wonderful. It says, God loves sparrows that a handful of them are sold for a couple of pennies. How much more valuable are you to God? 
if you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give good gifts to you? Affirmations. People of God. Yes, go ahead. Yes. Yes, as Carlos said. I have called you by name. You are mine. Bev, he has called you by name. Beverly, and you're his. Lauren, he's called you by name. He says, Lauren, you are mine. He says, we are bought with a price. Something far more precious than gold, silver, or precious stones. We have been bought with a price, the precious blood of Jesus. That's why we're his. Just speculation on my part, but I'm wondering if we need to sometimes go back and speak those affirmations back over our life. Speak them as if God is speaking them to us. Because God does really feel this way. I think if God was to appear, or if an angel was to appear, he might come to Kim and say, Kim, now you've, you've fainted because the angel's presence has just wiped you out, and but he's going to say, Kim, you are very precious to God. I think he'd say that of each of us. Not because we deserve it, but because of what Jesus did. Our righteousness is because of what Jesus did. He loves us. He affirms us. We are precious to him. Bill, every morning you should wake up relieved. But sometimes we don't. And that's why I just want to encourage us tonight. Allow the affirmation to fill our hearts. It was my time. Okay, we still got time. Okay, that was one of the points I wanted to make tonight. Do we really believe about ourselves what God has spoken about us? Or do we allow our self-talk to guide how we feel about ourselves? Listen to that statement. I wrote this statement this afternoon. Do we really believe about ourselves what God has spoken about us? Or do we allow our self-talk to guide how we feel about ourselves? And for most of us, we allow our self-talk to guide how we feel about ourselves. All right. Now let's get into the glimpse into the angelic and demonic realm. Verse 12. Then he said, don't be afraid, Daniel. The angel has appeared. Pick Daniel up. Uh, stand up. Oh, the second thing the angel said is stand up for I have been sent to you. Listen carefully for what I have to say to you. Listen carefully. The reason he needs to listen carefully is chapter 11 has an incredible amount of detail in it. Very odd details for someone in that century. In fact, one of my commentators said this, and uh, it's Stephen Miller says, Daniel would certainly need to listen carefully for the message he was about to receive, particularly chapter 11, was full of confusing detail couched in somewhat vague terms from the standpoint of 535 B.C. at least. Modern believers should note that the prophecies set forth in this revelation that has been fulfilled were fulfilled literally and exactly, and we're going to look at that next week. The prophecies of chapter 11, most of them, some of them are still in the future, have been filled literally and exactly, and they're all prophesied in such detail hundreds of years before they took place. This revelation has been fulfilled, were fulfilled literally and exactly. This demonstrates that the, prof the prophecies yet unfulfilled will be accomplished in similar fashion. So that's why Daniel had to pay attention. Okay, let's pick it up in verse 12. Then he said, don't be afraid, Daniel. Since the first day you began to pray for understanding, so that was 21 days before. Since the first day you began to pray for understanding and to humble yourself before your God, your request has been heard in heaven. I have come in answer to your prayer. But for 21 days, the spirit prince of the kingdom of Persia blocked my way. Then Michael, one of the archangels, came to help me. And I left him there with the spirit prince of the kingdom of Persia. Now I am here to explain what will happen to your people in the future, for this vision concerns a time yet to come. And while he was speaking to me, I looked down at the ground, unable to say a word. 
Then the one who looked like a man touched my lips, and I opened my mouth and began to speak. And I said to the one standing in front of me, I am filled with anguish because of the vision. I have seen my Lord, and I am very weak. How can someone like me, your servant, talk to you, my Lord? My strength is gone, and I can hardly breathe. Then again, the one who looked like a man touched me again, and I felt my strength returning. But let's go back to verses 12 through 14. Daniel started to pray for insight to the, that uh, insight for the vision that he had received. The first vision was mentioned in verse 1. And an angel was dispatched. The angel said, I was dispatched immediately when you prayed for understanding. I was dispatched immediately. But I couldn't get through. A demonic being, the NLT, the New Living Translation, translates it, the spirit prince, the Hebrew actually just literally says, the prince of Persia blocked my way. Now we know it couldn't have been a king or any type of a, a human being that could stand in his way because Michael was needed to, to come and fight with him. So an angel was dispatched immediately but couldn't get through because the demonic being, a spirit prince, blocked his way. And the angel couldn't get past this demon. There was some type of a, of a battle that must have been going on. So help comes, but it came 21 days later. This angel, for 21 of our days on earth, was in battle with the spirit prince. So the demon of Persia is a strong prince, but it says Michael, the archangel. Actually, the Hebrew literally says Michael, one of the chief princes. So Michael is also called a prince. The demonic spirit is called a prince, the prince of Persia, and Michael, one of God's angels, is also called one of the chief princes. So, there's some hierarchy, I guess, in the spiritual being. When Michael came on the scene, Michael went into battle with the prince of Persia, which freed this angel up to come down and speak to Daniel. It took 21 days for Michael to get there. I don't know what he was doing. Maybe he'd been on a three-week vacation. We don't know. Um, so, the demon of Persia had to have been a strong prince, but Michael was also strong. In verse 21, and let's just um, go to verse 20 and just pick up the end of this, this uh, insight into the demonic and the angelic realm. Uh, he replied, Do you know why I have come? Soon I must return to fight against the spirit prince of the kingdom of Persia, and after that the spirit prince of the kingdom of Greece will come. Meanwhile, I will tell you what is written in the book of truth. No one helps me against these spirit princes except Michael, your spirit prince. I have been standing beside Michael to support and strengthen him since the first year of the reign of Darius the Mede. What is going on in the heavenlies? Now, first of all, he says Michael is his prince. That doesn't mean Daniel. Basically, all the, all the scholars and the commentators say Michael is the prince over Israel. That is their specific angelic spirit. But this angel was fighting alongside Michael. The spirit prince of Persia, by the way, historically, that is the world ruling kingdom right now. It's going to be replaced by Greece. And then there's going to be a spirit prince of, prince of Greece that is going to be coming against the nation of Israel, which did happen. And that there is some things happening in the heavenlies. And Michael is going to be involved. So, all right. What can we learn about the realm of the spirit from these verses? Now, let me let me put some context here. I believe these verses are here for a reason. God didn't just randomly put these here. We didn't need to know this, but God made us aware of this. These verses are here for a reason. God the Father inspired them. Daniel recorded this. So God has a purpose in letting us get a glimpse of the battle which took place and was taking place. So, here's what I want you to kind of think about and give me your thoughts. Why did God give us a glimpse into the angelic, demonic realm? Why did God pull back the curtain a little bit and talk to us about this angel who got held up for 21 days because he was fighting with another demonic spirit? He finally was able to come down because now Michael's fighting with a demonic spirit. Now the angel's going to go back and fight with Michael against this demonic spirit, and then another one's going to come Okay, what's going on? And, and why, why didn't God intervene? All these different things. So let's go. What do you think? 
<laughs> what do you, what does this, what insights do you receive or what insights have you heard regarding the supernatural from these verses? Who's going to jump in first? Yes. I'm sorry. Uh, go, go here first. Yeah. That it's real and it does happen. That there are angels and there are demons and there are battles. Real battles. Good. Carla. Okay, once again. And um, she, uh, Carlos talking about that it shows us that sometimes the fight that we feel like we are in, even though maybe people are involved, is not just people. There's, there are spirit beings. There is a spiritual battle that is going on that is real. Of course, the book of, uh, of Ephesians reminds us that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against dark forces, rulers, rulers in the heavenly realm. So the reality of it. Anybody else? What does, this, what does this seem to indicate? Why would God give us this glimpse? They want to venture into this uncharted territory. What what Bill is saying is sometimes when we have prayed and it seems like our answers are not coming, that we wonder what's wrong with God. Why hasn't he heard us or why haven't he responded? In this case, there were other factors that impacted. And it was demonic forces. Very good. Now, somebody here who is... Oh, you were going to say the same thing. Wow, they're on the same wavelength. Okay, I have seven minutes, so I'm just going to go ahead and, and finish teaching here. I'm going to, there's been a lot that has been talked about from these verses as I grew up as a believer, talking about territorial spirits. Now, what has been described as a territorial spirit is a spirit that has been placed over a territory, and people have said that there are spirits over the United States or spirits over the city of Columbus or there might be spirits over your household, that there are territorial spirits and that there's this whole hierarchy and realm that is there. And so uh, material that has been written on spiritual warfare has gone to this passage and has tried to give us a sense of what the spiritual realm looks like and how we can do battle against these spiritual forces. Um, I'm not going to get into a lot of spiritual warfare things except to say this. Um, I'm going to talk to you about what the text says, what the text indicates. I'm going to, talk to, I'm going to make some assumptions based on what the text says. But over the years, I've begun to question some of the teachings which have come out of the text that there are demonic spirits assigned to our nations and our cities and that we do battle in the heavenlies against these spirits. I've begun to question it be for a couple of reasons. One, this is the only place that it is mentioned, and it's only mentioned about there being one spirit prince, or two, uh, Persia and Greece, but both of these seem to be very much focused on Israel. There may be, I'm not going to say that they're not the case, but I think we have to be really careful when we extrapolate that far out based on a very specific text. The other thing is, is I actually involved myself and went prayer and prayer walks and praying against principalities and powers over cities with others. And to be honest, uh, never saw it made a difference. Now, it might have. You know, I'm not certain that it did. So I've, I've, I've begun to question a little bit some of the spiritual warfare uh, teaching and doctrines that have been created. I'm not saying they're not true. I don't know that they're true or not, but I think we must be careful as the people of God to create an entire doctrine about something that has very specific, very, very 
small amount of text in the scripture about it and to extrapolate out that we should be coming against the, the prince over the United States or the prince over Canada or the prince over Mexico. I'm not sure that those exist. There are demonic spirits, but I don't know if specifically they're being assigned to these things. That's, that's just where I am at with this. You may have some great material and study and you have had some incredible experiences and I would love to hear what you have had. My experiences have not been the case. Uh, but I'm not going to dismiss them. So what can we learn about the spirit world from these verses? What did God show us in the scripture? Let me just give you a few things. First thing is, and we've already talked about, angels and demons or evil spirits are real. And some of them are very powerful. This angel that appeared to Daniel had so much power that people who didn't see him went and hid. Daniel fainted. Yet, he was held up for 21 days by a demonic spirit. That's a pretty powerful spirit. The people of God, hear what the Word of God says. I have given you authority over serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. One of the things we have to be careful of is when we hear about these type of incredibly powerful spiritual beings that we become terrified. Greater is he who is within you than he who is within the world. If you're walking with God and you are relying upon his spirit, there is great power. And there is also great supernatural power. But for those who aren't walking with God, can you understand how they could be so easily deceived and powerfully deceived if these beings are as incredibly powerful as are shown here? So that the, the, the supernatural realm is real. A demonic spirit hindered the work of an angel, which means that it, was, it, it hindered some of the work of God for a period of time. Now, here's the question. Why didn't God just send Michael sooner? Why didn't God intervene himself? Do you think that God couldn't have just said, get out of that angel's way. He's got to go talk to Daniel. He could have, but he didn't. The Bible doesn't tell us. So let's not speculate as to why. We just know that it did. Don't know why. It is very probable that demonic spirits are still hindering the work of God through angels that are trying to either deliver messages or work as battles are fought in the unseen world. Bill has already said that. It's possible that some of our prayers are being held up, not because God is not answered them, but because something is happening in the supernatural. It is very probable that that is still taking place. Daniel continued to pray and fast, even when the answer took 21 days. I think this speaks to us about the need, and Bill hinted at it, that we continue in prayer, even when the answers aren't coming, for there may be a reason that they are, they are being held up. If Daniel would have stopped praying for this insight, would somehow the angel have not finished coming? We don't know. The Bible doesn't say, so let's not speculate. But Daniel did. He stayed persistent. What we do know is there is a spirit prince of Persia that was, that was there during this day. Okay? There will also be coming a spirit prince of Greece, which will come later. Both of those were world powers. I think it is probable to speculate that there are probably demonic influences over powerful world governments. Remember, what was happening starting in the first year of Cyrus? The Jews were going back to their land. God was beginning to bless the nation of Israel again. And who do we have? We have this prince who is coming against Maybe he was trying to come against the ability of, of God to release the Jews, but it still happened anyhow. There is a spirit prince of Persia. There will be a spirit prince of Greece. That will be another world power. There's also a chief prince of angels, one of the chief princes of angels, named Michael, who seems to be assigned to Israel. That is what we know in the passage. But we can speculate a little bit that there is far more happening around us than we see. There are battles that are happening. I don't know 
what our prayers do to assist or not assist the battles. I've heard it taught that your prayers make it possible for these angels to somehow break through the demonic spirits. I've, been, I've had people teach that. I don't believe the scripture teaches it, but yet in one sense it's possible. If I had the authority over serpents and scorpions and all the power of the enemy, maybe it is up to me to be praying against that spirit, to be praying against that which is coming upon my household, to be praying against that which is possibly coming upon a church. I don't know if an individual spirit is assigned to Columbus First Assembly and is going to be uh, hindering the work of Columbus First Assembly and now till Jesus comes. I don't know that that's true. I do know that from time to time there has been spirits that have come against this congregation and I can look back at our history and say that probably had a strong influence in my time here I have felt the sense that the enemy has come and has tried to do some things and I have stood against and you others of you have stood with me against and we have battled through there are supernatural powers I say all of that to say we we need to be careful that we don't allow lots of things to be made into doctrine that the Bible isn't necessarily seeing, yet at the same time, I think we just don't throw it out as if there's not something to learn. And so I'm leaving you with a lot of vagueness here this evening. But some things we do know, there's battle going on. Angels are powerful, demonic spirits are powerful, the Spirit of God within you is more powerful. These demonic spirits do attack or they hinder, or they try to influence. And we have supernatural ability to stand firm against them. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. We are taught to, in Ephesians to put on the full armor of God and to stand against the schemes or the wiles, depending on your translation, of the enemy. If anything, this passage reminds us that we need to be diligent. We need to be strong in the Lord. We need to be ready to do battle, to wrestle against these dark forces. They come against marriages, they come against families, they come against churches, they come against nations, they come against towns, they come against our physical body. But greater is he who is within me and within you, if the Spirit of God lives within you, and I'm assuming that he does, greater is he who is within me than he that is within the world. It's a real realm and God opened the curtain a little bit, I think Daniel was absolutely floored. When he heard this, I know he was floored, literally, when he encountered the, the spirit being. But I think when this was told him, and he processed it, he had insight that he never had before, and the Holy Spirit kept the insight for us also, so that we could peek in. Well, that's chapter 10. We're going to call it a night. Lord Jesus, thank you for this evening. Lord, may something that has been spoken tonight get bound to our hearts. Lord, I pray especially for the part of the message of our need to hear words of affirmation. May each of us go back and remind ourselves of those verses that are in our hearts I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. Greater is he that is within me than he that is within the world. I have loved you with an everlasting love. Are you not more valuable than a few sparrows? Lord, speak the affirming words in our hearts and may it strengthen our souls and our spirits. And may we be in your word that it can feed us and that you could speak even more and other affirming words in our lives in Jesus' name. Amen. Good night. You've been listening to a message from Columbus First Assembly. We hope that you've been encouraged in your spiritual journey. If you're not part of a local church and would like to attend one of our regular services, our church is located at the corner of 10th and Iowa Street in Columbus, Indiana. Our Sunday morning worship services start at 10 a.m. and our Wednesday evening studies begin at 7 p.m. 
And while you're online, check out our website at columbusfirstassembly.org for details and information about our church. You will also find other messages and series that you can listen to or download. Thanks for spending some time with us and for taking advantage of this resource from Columbus First Assembly, where we strive to learn and live the word and ways of God.